Hey guys, it's Friday evening and it's time for the Retro Buzz. And we've got a very happy, very excited Mr. Glenn Palomino, Plan a Tomato, Plan a Mento, uh, with us as Plan his... a memo. Yeah, you know, you've got you've got your uh Star Wars yoke. You're what, thirteen thousand away from your goal? Thirteen thousand away from thirty. Yeah, we've only been it's only been live uh, a week today. A uh, week today, seven in the morning, we're at twenty eight thousand three hundred, I think, or or six hundred, something like that. So, so thirteen hundred, not thirteen thousand. Right, right. We're very close. I, I'm expecting like a baby, newborn baby, any minute now. We're going to cross that that threshold, and that the first Kickstarter is a success. Uh, See, so quick. Um, before the show, you told me thirteen thousand, but in reality, it's thirteen hundred. Thirteen hundred. Yeah, you know me. What's money? It don't matter to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad we have this guy here, uh, Mr. Cool Toy. He doesn't look like Chris Jericho this week, but um, we have him <laughs> in all his glory because he's got, he's got you got the hat on today, so you're not looking like Jericho. I think you did that to like really get on Stevie last week. I think. Yeah, I gotta I gotta blend back into my normal routine. I I get 50 percent of people tell me where's the hat, and other 50 percent of my comments <laughs> tell me it's hat. So, well. It's great to have you on here, and then we also have a, a special guest that he was here before, but then he broke my TriCaster, but he's back. We've got Mr. RGT85, <laughs> Sean Long. Welcome to the show. Welcome! Did you get the, post did you get the post-dated check for the TriCaster? <laughs> I know I post-dated it in a couple of years. Well, but I, I, I just have this. I honestly just have to say it was, it was, it was great the fact that you managed to kind of stay in the chat room and be on video. And you guys were miming, and I could hear you, but they couldn't the last time. So, <laughs> kudos for you for that, my my friend. <laughs> and it looks Sometimes like you got to improv. Dougie's having a little bit of problem. It looks like so we're gonna get that yeah. resolved here. But I think he's, I think he's gonna switch around his resolution or whatnot. But Glenn, why don't you kick That's, us off he, here? He looks and, great. He looks great. And and tell <laughs> us tell about the guest here. Well, yes. Well, we have the one and only RGT eighty five. He actually has a new book out, which we were going to talk about a little bit here. This is a nice little book I got off Amazon, and it's about, well, it's about this system right here, which is always a little bit of money and tons when you try and pick it up, and you got the real deal here. We have an original Tower of Power unit here, Sega, and RGT is a big Sega fan. He's a big gaming fan overall with everything, but... I definitely know he's got his heart in Sega, and uh, it's an honor having RGT85 online with us today. What with, with sound? It's great. I'd like to hear him. It's an honor to be here. It's an honor to be here. <laughs> well, Did we lose Doug. Is he is he back? Or is he I, I'm working. I'm working on getting Doug. I think Doug, if you can hear us, try to try to call back in um, and get going. But one of the things you have is that brand new book. And yep. so, why don't you tell everybody a little bit about the book while we work on getting Dougie back in? Sure. So this is the complete Sega 32X guide. A lot of people ask me why I decided to do a book on the Sega 32X. I'm a very impulsive person, and I literally just woke up one day last year. I believe it was like in April, and I was like, you know what? I'm going to write a book on the 32X because I, because I want to. And so I just started like figuring it out on my own, um, and then I actually had a buddy – um, who I've worked with on Nintendo Enthusiast website for years. And um, I ran the idea by him and I showed him like a prototype of like my design for the book, which was absolutely horrible because I'm not very good at graphics and things like that. And he was like, you know, I, I have some editing software, you know, I can maybe design the book for you if you want, you know, we'll talk the business end of it. And I was like, yeah, that's cool. So we ended up coming up with this. I basically just wrote everything for it. Um, it has basically just um, all the information about the 32X, um, reviews for every game, including um, Sega CD 32X games as well. Um, there's a lot of promotional materials, canceled games that didn't come out for the system, stories from people like um, Blake J. Harris from Console Wars, Al Nilsson from Sega, Modern Vintage Gamer, GameSack, and then um, it's got a bunch of cool um, advertisements for the 32X from all across the world. Um, they had some very interesting ads in Europe of all places. I think those were my favorite things. But yeah, it's, it's 99 pages long. You know, I didn't want to make it 
too long or anything like that. But it came out, you know, it came out pretty good. It's a pretty legit book. You can get it on Amazon. Uh, just type in 32X book and it'll pop right up. I believe Ryan from Castle Mania Games also still has some available as well. The only difference is you have to pay shipping on those. Um, it's $19.99 at either store, but you have to pay shipping with Ryan. But those books are signed. So if you care about some homeless looking man's scribble on the book, <laughs> that might interest you. But yeah. If you wanna um, if you wanna yeah. save some money, it looks like it's seventeen dollars and twenty three cents and you don't need the, the, the uh homeless man's signature. If you don't. There you go. There you go. <laughs> See <laughs> Now do you know there's a there's a fun fact for everyone. Do you know why it's only ninety nine pages? Tell us you know a wise one. Anyone? Oh simple mine mine didn't make the cut. He didn't like what I wrote. So my, my <laughs> there's there actually is a reasoning behind it though because if you look at me me and the my buddy the designer were talking about it if you look at it um so like every page on the bottom has the little Sega 32x mushroom and then a number and so we were looking at it and he was like well we could do like another page on it and I was like yeah we could and then he was like but you know what if I do it because it's completely centered I'd have to make the thing bigger for every one of them. I was like, oh, don't worry about it then. We'll just do it 99, like, why not? <laughs> Sounds like a lot of work. Yeah, like, honestly, it didn't take me very long to write everything. Like, I would say I had everything pretty much written in about two months, you know? Like, I would just spend, you know, because I had I have all the 32X games um, cartridge-wise, and I'm pretty familiar with them anyways, but you know, some of the games I wasn't, I, you know, little didn't really know much about them. Like FIFA 96 didn't come out um, stateside. So I had to get a, um, a repro of that cartridge. And then, you know, like a couple other games, like I just wasn't super familiar with or whatever, but I would just play the games. And then the, the CD 32 X games, I just downloaded ISOs of them because I'm not, you know, eh, whatever. And then um, so I, just wrote, <laughs> I wrote everything up and we I just threw it in a Google doc. And then he just got to work on the designing aspect. And that, that probably took a lot longer than actually writing it. And so people, it's impressive because I am not, a, I'm not a writer and it was a good read. I mean, I sat down, I you know, read it from cover to cover and there was some information I didn't know in there and, and it was pretty knowledgeable. And it's just really cool just seeing some of the older, like advertisers can remember them, which is kind of even more weird. But it, it's a yeah. shame because the the 32x kind of put so much, such a bad taste in so many people's mouths back in the day. But it's not a bad attachment. For some reason back then, because of the Saturn coming out, people just thought it was like, as a cash grab. But it actually added more colors, more processing power, scaling and zoom. It, it added a lot to the machine, and it's just a shame that it came out at a time where people just wanted nothing to do with it. Yeah, it's it, it, that's really what it boils down to was the timing of it. I think if they would have done their original plan with the Saturn, as far as the release of the Saturn, that um, the 32X might have had a longer life cycle, and there probably would have been more games for it because, like, they the the whole arcade stuff would have been, I think, the strongest thing about the 32X because obviously your Super Nintendo and your Genesis weren't able to do you know, 3D polygons. Like, yes, you had the Super FX chip and you had, you know, a few, you know, first person shooters on the, the Saturn or on the Super Nintendo, a couple on the Genesis. Um, but you didn't really have all that, all, all that you could do with it. And I think the 32X, I mean, because when you look at Virtual Fighter on the 32X versus, versus the initial release of Virtual Fighter on the Sega Saturn, sure, the Sega Saturn version looks a little better, but the Virtual Fighter on the 32X actually plays better because it wasn't as rushed and i think that you know you could have had things like daytona usa and other popular sega arcade games from that time come to the system daytona usa was actually in development for the system right now, how good right. would it have been I, you know that's another question for another i mean virtual racing deluxe on the 32x was really good so i think they could have made it work it's just it didn't you know it didn't really have a a, a real chance to get going right. and do anything Right, because these were also first-generation titles. So as they got to learn to program the architecture, I think Daytona USA definitely could have come out. Yeah, and the problem was um, Sega of America hated it. Absolutely. Yes, they did. <laughs> that, that's one of the big stories in the book that um, Al Nielsen, who was um, uh, working at Sega at that time, like that's how the book starts. I spent my entire time at Sega trying to kill the 32X. It's like they didn't like it. They did not like it, but... 
you know, it, it's a cool little system. I think it has a, a decent story to tell, and I tried to tell it. So even if you didn't have uh, a 32X or played a 32X, could you get the book and still get into it? Maybe. <laughs> I mean, it, You're I supposed you like, to say, you know, yes, absolutely, go buy I mean, the I, book. Yeah, but then if people buy it and then they're like, he lied to me, then I'll get a bad review on Amazon. <laughs> like, I've already gotten like two troll reviews on Amazon like already. And that's Only? why it's... Yeah, I'm you, actually I'm actually kind of surprised, but please, I was please say, don't increase that. That's pretty good. You only got you only got two. Uh, Consider. I mean, yeah. if you like if you like Sega and you like retro gaming, you know, you would have at least heard of the 32x. Like, I would buy a book on the Neo Geo, and I'm not the biggest, you know, Neo. I'm a very very casual Neo Geo fan. I do not own a Neo Geo. All the Neo Geo games I've played have just been either in the arcades or on things like the switch with the um the hamster ports that they do for like you know samurai showdown and stuff like that so if you're interested in sega stuff and you like retro gaming you'll probably have some interest in it if you're not interested in sega or retro gaming you, you probably wouldn't care i'm gonna have to i think that. sean's probably underselling it a little bit because just from a historical aspect it has a lot of information in it like i said you may not be the biggest sega 32x fan to begin with but you're probably gonna have a lot more respect for the console and everything that went into it and came out from it just from reading this book because there's a lot of things like i'm a diehard sega fanboy and have been through and through and even reading this there's tons of stuff that i didn't know um i know that rgt had a, a sibling or a, a significant other named rgt 88 apparently he was having a rough day when he was doing the signature so I, i've got a one of one rgt 88 <laughs> signature but uh, other than that like i said this is actually a really great book so and it's easy to digest like i said it's not that's a pirate right. copy, pirate <laughs> copy. <laughs> yeah. it didn't come from him. that it was that copy. was sean's partner that he's selling it from he didn't have an extra copy go. so he quickly signed it right it was the most writer yeah my hand hurts so much because like oh, Brian, <laughs> Brian from Castlevania got like 200 of them. I was like, oh, that doesn't sound bad. And then all the books finally came in from Amazon because I, 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 everything is through Amazon. So like if I want an author's copy, I just order it off Amazon. They, they print it there and then they ship it to me. So like I had 200 books just like sitting in my house and I was like, Ooh, this looks like a lot more than I realized. And I'm like, I just started signing them in like 20, I was like 20 or 21 into it. And I was like, ah, oh, my hand, my crippling arthritis. So, I was like, oh, so, man, this, so this is a lot. Michael Barnett in the chat room wants to know is if you were going to write another book, I, I'm assuming based on another type of a uh, retro console, would you, what would you, what would you like to cover with that? Well, I actually was thinking about another one. And it was another obscure console, but um, Jeffrey Wittenhagen, who does uh, Hagen's Alley books, um, he does a lot of books on retro uh, systems and stuff. I actually, uh, a couple of years ago, I actually contributed to one of his books. Um, he actually just did the system that I was thinking of doing, and that was the Virtual Boy, um, just because that's that's another like you know kind of weird system. But when I was a kid, I don't I don't know what the hell was wrong with me as a kid, but when I was a kid, like I just had a weird desire for the weird systems like i remember one christmas i was told that i could get a sega saturn a sony playstation or a virtual boy and i chose the virtual boy like Ooh. like no question because i remember i used to go to kb toys and they had a virtual boy set up there and i just thought it was the coolest thing ever and like every time i would go they had these little pamphlets as well and i'd always take a pamphlet with me and my mom would be like you already have one of those pamphlets and i'd be like shut up i want another and then i would just sit there and play the virtual boy so i really love the virtual boy but you know obviously he just did a book on it. and you know tons of people do books on similar stuff but um I wouldn't really want to, you know, try to step on his toes or anything because he's a buddy of mine. So I don't know. You know, I've thought about doing something, you know, uh, maybe with the Sega Saturn, but it would have to be if, if I did a Saturn thing, it would have to be North America only just because a there's so many Japanese games and B there's so many Japanese games that I don't know because they're, you know, not translated or anything. So that would just be absolutely just probably too much but i don't you know i might it just depends really this was just a passion project it was just you know the the world of books you don't really make a whole hell of a lot of money my whole goal with this book was to make back my initial investment and then everything else i was happy with 
And really my investment, I don't consider my time to be part of the investment. I just consider it, you know, part of my work or whatever. I paid my editor X amount of dollars, which wasn't very much because I don't know, he was stupid, I guess. <laughs> and uh, he, gets a certain, he gets a percentage of all the sales. So, you know, he makes his money. And then I paid, um, I had a special ghost editor, um, uh, Joe from GameSack. I basically paid him like a hundred bucks. And I was like, all right, here's the deal. You're going to look over all my reviews. You're going to look over all my tech information because I'm not releasing something that has misinformation and you are the biggest nerd I know when it comes to this stuff. So just look over everything. And he, you know, he was cool was enough that, to do wait, that. Wait, was that before or after you got your US uh, Sega Tower of Power? Did he review it before or after you had gotten that? It was before. <laughs> okay. <laughs> good, good call on that one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but no, you know, he's, he's over it now. Um, but yeah, so, you know, yeah, I think so. I think so. Um, he helped me with that, you know, and that was a, that was a tremendous help because I didn't, I didn't want there to be, you know, cause I'm, I'm, I'm definitely not when it comes to retro stuff, you know, I feel like there's very hardcore dedicated people who are like RGB modding all their systems and, you know, you know, soldering crap on there and stuff. And like, that's awesome. And then there's people that are very casual and that's cool too. And I'm sort of in the middle. Like I like the more advanced stuff of retro gaming, but I don't necessarily understand the, the tech specs behind it. And I also like the casual stuff where, you know, the cheap uh, uh, AliExpress $30, 500 game in one handheld system i can still appreciate that so i kind of fall in the middle so i just wanted someone who was more knowledgeable in the tech side of things to look over the stuff so joe was cool enough to do that yeah jim's saying he just ordered your book um he said oh, he, got you, 30, he got the 32x when it came out and then michael barnett says you might need a uh 3d glasses to read the book if you did it on the 3ds or I'm sorry, the, yeah. the, the virtual boy. Excuse the me. virtual boy, yeah. And everything would be red and black. Like, yeah. like Jeff, I, I will say Jeffrey and and Jeffrey, I don't know if like he got in my head with it, but like that's how his book is. Like it, it's, it's you know, all the pages are in red and black. Like it looks so good. And it's like, even if I did one on the virtual boy, I don't think it would necessarily look as good as his came out. So, you know, maybe maybe as as time passes, then I'll I'll take a stab at it, but we'll see. So yeah, I don't know. I know Glenn, you had it, and I think Doug, you had the 32x. I had the Sega Master System. I had the Sega Genesis. I I skipped over that. Got the Saturn, and then I got. I had Sega CD. I know, like everybody else, sold them, but Dreamcast was my my go to. Like I love yeah. the Dreamcast. Yeah. It's like my favorite across the board, even to this day. It's such a sad um, story. That is such a sad it, story it is. because th 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 even today, I was just talking about this the other day that if you took a Dreamcast game today, like right now, and you played it, it could pass almost for a current gen title. A PS1 game could not. And it's just, it was that advanced. It's, it was a great console, but again, Sega had turned off so many people during that Saturn 32X era. And then piracy really came in really big and really sealed the fate for it. But that is probably the best thing they ever came out with. It's a fantastic system. And you know, if Sega ever came back, I'd love to see Dreamcast 2. There's that much love for that Dreamcast system. Well, Glenn, my son, he's he's seven, and he played it for the first time when I got it. I got it for like 120 bucks at a local retro shop, you know, with warranty and everything. Um, because like many of us, we sold it, and my son's like, how old is this, Dad? I said, this was like when I was young. It was like 20, 30 years ago, and he's like, why? It looks just as good as everything else that's out there, and, and that's yep. to prove your point. You know, that's my son who's seven you know, plays Fortnite and Minecraft to him. It looks a lot better than that. So, <laughs> you know. Right. Well, it's what, what, like... RGT, what RGT said a minute ago, you know, these some of these systems, like he gravitated, he said, towards these quirky systems. And that's exactly what I did. 32X, uh, I have three Virtual Boys. Um, I have two. Why There's... doesn't that surprise There's... me? <laughs> well, to be honest, I was, I was helping repair the LCD screens on them. There's a solder fix. And I was trained by uh, someone in the Virtual Boy forums to help him out, but it just came to be like too much. But these systems, what happens is like the 32X, it's been bad mouth for years, years and years. So people think that's fact. Then a book like, you know, a book like this comes out and you start reading, you find out if you never touched it, maybe they were wrong. 
and then you get it and you find out, you know what, it was a good system. The Virtual Boy is a good system. It was just bad press because it was one color at a time where, mm. you know, there were color games out. But you can't always rely on, you know, the internet being factual for everything um, because 32X is a fine system. The Virtual Boy was a great system, but they get so much bad press over the years. It's just, it's just shunned into a corner. It's a shame. Yeah, I a mean, a lot of it stems from bad, you know, support from Sega America as a whole. And like yep. Sean had alluded to, they wanted to kill that the moment it came through because they wanted to focus on, you know, what was in their future as far as the Saturn and, you know, the Dreamcast later down the road. They didn't want to support this secondary kind of like fill in system, is how they viewed it. So it got, you know, little to no support from Sega America. And then what support it did get, it was very hard to actually find games, at least in my area when I grew up. I had this Sega 32X. It got, discounted very quickly and early into its lifespan so that immediately put a, a sour taste in a lot of people's mouth the early adopters that went out and bought this new add-on that you know expanded their genesis capabilities and gave them all these great games but when it came down to it they ended up getting undercut by a price you know six months three months down after they paid full price for it and then when it came to actually trying to find games there was typically only like three or four of them ever on the shelves at my local kb stores or toys r us it was very hard to actually find the 32x games let alone the 32x cd games now you guys are going to make me go buy one because i do it it actually is it actually is and they're not expensive although they're starting to i think rgt will tell you the, the prices are going up now uh quite yeah. a bit but there's some really good gems on there i mean it's even in the book i agree with the I didn't play the FIFA, you know, the, uh, the the sports games and stuff in there, but the uh, the Polygon games like Metalhead, I love Metalhead. I do like the Star Wars. You know, it's very hard. It's some boring on some levels. The Star Wars arcade, there's a lot of good games on there. Space Harrier, it's a great arcade port. You know, that's something you couldn't have done on the Genesis alone, and it, it plays great on the 32X. And it has the best um, console version of Mortal Kombat 2. Like, because the Saturn, the only one that comes close is the Saturn, but the Saturn has um, the Shang Tsung issue where whenever you um, morph. Do a morph into another character, it, it lags out for like two or three seconds. Right. <laughs> and so, yeah, Mortal Kombat 2 on the 32X is technically the most arcade, uh, authentic version of that game of that time frame. So now, John. And it also had a, oops, sorry. No, 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 no. I'm just, just going to read the chat. It, it, go ahead. Go ahead. You do that. I was just going to say, it also had the console port of Doom. So, you know, when PC gaming was kind of in its early infancy and, you know, finally starting to catch on with, you know, Windows being everywhere it was. But I had a couple of buddies that were PC gamers and my family being poor definitely wasn't going to buy me a computer just to play video games. You know, that was for educational purposes only. That's PCs. But to be able to play Doom on a console was pretty amazing, in my opinion. That was one of the first games I picked up for my 32X. Yeah, and John Diamond and in the chat room, uh, he says, you know, virtual racing and Star Wars may be the only good games for the 32X, but he said, even then, they were outdated already. Well, because well, I mean, the Saturn was coming out, but, you know, I wouldn't say that. You know, the, the Saturn mean, was on the cut. The games, the games themselves were still very good. What do you think, RGT? Yeah, I mean, ugh. I mean, games like Virtual Fighter, you know, virtual racing and star wars arcade those are in knuckles chaotic too you know those were some of the, the best games on the system and I don't, I don't think they were outdated because i mean when you look at look at the launch games for the sega saturn you had daytona usa which was a terrible version of that game to where they had to re-release it as a championship circuit edition look at virtual fighter which was a terrible version of that game where they had to re-release it as um virtual fighter remix so i don't know i mean it's it's kind of it's kind of up to your own interpretation i feel but i think i think they still sort of stood out um especially when you look at you know um the super nintendo couldn't do a 3d fighter the genesis couldn't do a 3d fighter the jaguar tried with fight for life and that was just oh. absolutely broken oh. <laughs> neo geo you know was only doing 2d fighter so you know now the n64 was also on the horizon the playstation one was also on the horizon so eventually yes they would have been outdated but i think at the time of the release of those games i think they still had a place in the market and matt matt scott just said he just bought an autographed copy so his Thank is going you, over matt. to Germany. Gave you... oh wow 
Yeah. So make Appreciate sure you get it, that autograph right on there. Otherwise, it's coming all the way back from Germany, and he's going to want you to <laughs> redo it. <laughs> just that's so just, I'm just that phone. Did you see that super chat? I did not. Go ahead and read it. I'm I'm jumping back and forth. So what what? Go ahead and read okay, it. Okay, this from this from Slings uh, Spade. Uh, he wanted me to ask John D if he's listening. How will the coronavirus? How will it affect the production of the new arcade one up cabs? Oh. Man, that virus. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, you mean I work doesn't... in the medical field, so the amount of coronavirus conference calls I've been on this week is astounding. So I literally yeah. don't want to hear the word coronavirus. All right, so ever let's again. let's ask it this yeah. way. Let's ask Doug, it. Doug and I are both in the medical field, so that's what we had all all week was that. Um, I, I don't know. To be honest, I'm going to tell you something. Uh, you know, because I have production out in in uh, you know that area of Asia, and they're right now in the Chinese like New Year, and the, the factories are closed. And I've been told that some of the factories are going to stay closed at least another week to week and a half because of it. Till February so it could 10th. actually delay. Till February yeah, 10th. Yeah, so it actually could, it could delay a lot of things, actually. This is why we told you guys back when these guys were on, when the CES announcements came, we said that's the reason they don't give any launch dates because things like this is beyond their control and they there's nothing that they can do about it. But... It's making me wonder, Doug, the flight sticks that we got from Glenn, where did they come from? <laughs> Glenn, <laughs> what are you doing to us? And I licked all of them before I shipped them. So, Well, if you I licked them, the then, that, then, we're, then, we're, then we're good. I was wondering why mine came with a little bottle of Purell inside. <laughs> But um, I did want to, I, you know, we were talking about Sean's book, and we, we have that pulled up. But, I, but, you know, I wanted to show everybody, if you do want to get involved, so it sounds better coming from me than Glenn saying it to you. But So I'll pimp it out for him. Go over to the Kickstarter here. Glenn is very, very close. <laughs> He's getting very close. Um, and it's here it is in dollars, not in yen. So nobody can get confused. But uh, 22 days to go, Glenn. And some people were asking if you go over the mark, what is the um the, the focus going to be on are you just going to um just continue mass produce this stuff or are you going to actually come out with something else that now you can fund something else well you know obviously we got to make the amount of uh, product for the people placing the orders um fortunately i'm not signing anything maybe i will i don't know but now that rgt saying was hurting his hand after a couple maybe <laughs> i'll leave that alone you better sign it but um the, you know, if we do hit a stretch goal, it's a, it's a far stretch goal for $50,000. We're just going to make sure it's also compatible with the Atari Arcade. But honestly, um, we have other plans. And I, I've said it before, you know, we're definitely looking at steering wheels with a gear shifter and pedals. We have a light gun technology that is a cutting edge light gun technology uh, coming out. Other controllers. So this is really just showing to me uh, by the amount of how fast it, it's going to hopefully meet the goal so quickly within maybe under 10 days that people do want to have these authentic controllers to use at home. So, you know, lots of arcade machines out there are custom controllers. I mean, look at a, like a battle zone with the dual sticks or uh, like I said, the light gun or steering wheels or games like that are very hard to play, like uh, Frontline. I love Taylor's Frontline, but you can't play that uh, well the way it is. So I have all these things planned out. And since the Kickstarter is working so well and it, it's going to help us fund things faster and get them out and, and give extra bonuses, like, you know, like, like all the, the pledge gifts that are, are out there, we'll expand and all that. So the answer is yes. I mean, it's, it's going to really help me expand and give you guys, again, very high quality, inexpensive things you can use at home or in the arcade or just take the bed with you like my, like my Sega. <laughs> <laughs> oh, brother. Could you see this, a GRS version of that, Doug? That's going to be like, <laughs> oh, my. Hey, I'll buy it. I, I'm, I'm a sucker yeah. for Sega. Hey, yeah. If Glenn put, starts pimping out some GRS Sega products, I'll, I'll buy them. I'm not going to lie. We definitely, need a, we definitely need a Dreamcast Mini. I mean, they definitely should do oh. that. There no, <laughs> one of the things I was a little disappointed of when they came up the Tower of Power, I felt they, they had a huge missed opportunity. When you got your Sega Mini, uh, my other friend, uh, um, 8-Bit Flashback, kind of does this already. You can put NFC or a small SD card in a 32X top and the Sega CD bottom. And you could actually purchase those independently. And you could have added Sega CD games when you connected it via NFC. And the 32X drop down. That was a huge miss on their part. I would have went out there and bought 
you know, a bunch of these just so I can dock it to, to a, a mini Sega CD. And a, who are a mini you kidding? You would have bought. You would have bought five of each. <laughs> like, who are you kidding? Well, well, yes, yes, but that is that's the stuff that was a, a missed opportunity that they could have sold more games. They could have had a higher price point by selling you another, you know, ninety dollar Sega CD attachment with a bunch of ISO games on it, and then a thirty two X attachment. Because to be honest, like RGT was saying a second ago, and myself. The 32X, there wasn't a huge production run to begin with. And you know, the prices are going up, so people are going to find it harder to get one to play the games in an original form factor. So brings up an interesting uh, subject, because this is something I've been chewing on the last couple weeks, is I want to I kind of talk to Sean about this. And I'm sure I, we've seen videos where you, you've worked with the arcade one-up cabinets. You've kind of gotten your, your hands on with some of those things. What's your take on this virtual pinball boom that's been happening? I mean, we've seen companies like Toy Shock come out. I've got one over here. Um, Arcade One Up announces one at CES. We know At Games is working on one behind the scenes, which we'll probably see later this year. And I'm and I know there's a couple other companies that are that are doing it. Is this a fad? Is this something, in your opinion, that is going to be short lived, or do you think that uh, this is the real deal and it's going to be around for a while? <laughs> I personally feel that it won't, it, I don't think it'll be necessarily as successful as the arcade one up machines have been. Um, as far as people, you know, really wanting to get them and people still wanting continuous ones. Pinball is just, it, it's, it's not a scene that I'm super familiar with. I remember playing stuff like uh, Batman pinball, uh, Terminator pinball, which was one of my favorites. Uh, Jurassic Park, you know, back in the 90s when, you know, arcades were more frequent. I think pinball is popular. I'll definitely be getting a virtual pinball table just to check it out because I think it's it sounds absolutely fascinating. But I don't I, I to me, I don't think the collectability aspect will be quite as high as the arcade one ups are, because I, I don't know, it's just it's just weird, like seeing when you get the arcade one up built and you start playing it for a while, you're like, I need more of these. I, I want more of these. I want more of these arcade games I grew up with. Whereas I'm not quite sure pinball has that same high nostalgia. And I could be wrong. Like I know there's a lot of pinball communities out there, but at least for me personally, I don't have nearly as many attachments to pinball machines as I do, um, you know, arcade machines. But that being said, if they were to release like a Batman one, like I would buy it day one. And I'll probably buy like the Star Wars one on day one. Yes, I think we're all we're all on that uh, front there. The Star Wars one is like the be all end all right now. <laughs> yeah, Doug's got his hand up. <laughs> <laughs> but but you're right. You're absolutely right. I know my wife will be happy to hear that because she's like, you have all these arcade one ups running down. You know, you got the Legends, and then you've got the Toy Shock. Does that mean now you're gonna fill up another room with just virtual pinball? <laughs> so she's probably another not gonna condo. be thrilled to have all this. You know, yeah. No, we can't do that. No, we're not even going to go. <laughs> we're not going to go there. Um, but it's interesting because I see a lot of people have been, you know, they're like, yeah, 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 this is really, really cool. But, you know, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm one of those guys like, with, like you're saying with pinball, it's, it's a novelty thing, right? Like you might play. I don't play pinball as much as I play the other arcades. Is that like, is that a fair assessment? I think so. I mean, I, you know, I could sit down. You know, I can sit down and play my arcade one, like my Turtles cab, and play it start to finish. You know, either Turtles or Turtles in Time, and not you know not want to do anything else. I want to sit there and play the game. I can sit there and play you know Final Fight or Strider and you know Mortal Kombat, all that stuff. And it you know you just sit there and you keep wanting to play it. It's relaxing. Whereas pinball to me has always been, you know, I'll play it for you know five to fifteen minutes and then I'm done. Like yeah. you know I could go you know, for a, a long period of time without playing it. It just doesn't, it doesn't really bring me into it quite as much. Even, you know, when I go to a barcade or something like that, like I would say 90% of my time is done on arcade machines, you know, messing around and, you know, 10% is done with the pinball machines. But I'm not good at pinball either, so that might have. Well, to do with it's it. fun. My daughter, and my son, they, they had never, they'd never played pinball ever until I got the toy shock machine. And then, you know, they were like, oh, this is this is cool. But some folks in here are even asking in the YouTube chat. They're saying nobody's ever asked for a Metal Slug cabinet from Arcade 1-Up. I think that would – I love Metal Slug. I play it on my Legends well, Ultimate all the time. people have been asking for that since day one. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. That's, that's, that's that's good. Good. Oh, Doug, Doug's like, yeah, that was me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, that, that'd be, a, that'd be a, a fun game. And they want to know your the opinion. One thing I want to I want to ask uh, RGT because um, I'm going to interrupt you, but I seem to do that a lot, and I am so, I am sorry, man. You know, you know I, what I it is though, that. and it's not. It, and I want to put this out there: it's not Glenn. He he wears these wireless headphones, and I honestly think there's somewhat of a delay between that and the hearing aid. <laughs> Just saying. Is it, hearing, is it that or the cotton balls you put in so you can't hear me? <laughs> no, go ahead, Glenn. Go, and I'll get back to the question then after. To R- RGT, you know, uh, you know. People don't always get to, to interact with, you know, with YouTubers in this fashion. And, you know, RT, RGT85 is obviously a YouTuber. He's had a, a very successful channel. But RGT, you've had other, uh, I guess, fingers in the in the gaming industry, right? You didn't just come out off the street with nothing. Didn't you have, like, work for a company or you wrote articles, something along those lines in the past I've before been, you started your channel? Yeah, I've been around since uh, 2012 um, in video game stuff, which a lot of people don't realize. But... Um, I actually started on a very small website. I knew one of the writers personally. Um, and I was like, what are you doing writing for this website? What's that like? And he was like, oh, it's pretty cool. And I was like, yeah, what's cool about it? He was like, oh, you know, I get companies send me games. I was like, wait, you get free games? He's like, yeah. I was like, oh, I, I was like, can I write for it? He was like, I don't know. Can you write? And like, you know how they say in school, like kids are either good at like, um, english and history or they're either good at math or science i was terrible at math or science but i could bullshit my way through english and history class like it was nothing so i've always been good at writing it's just nothing i really ever pursued and so they gave me a little trial run and they're like oh yeah you're pretty good so yeah i started there in uh 2012 um and i remember it was just so freaking cool like i was getting packages from like konami and capcom because i was doing a lot of 3ds stuff for the site and um yeah like i remember capcom sent me like three copies of resident evil revelations on the 3ds and they sent me a a cool little beanie that was modeled after chris's beanie in the game and it had like a a headphone slot in it and um it came with a headphone as well just little cool things like that and um so yeah that's i started doing that the website um kind of started quieting down the owner of the website ended up becoming like a big twitch streamer and then people just started going their own ways and so i was doing a lot of nintendo stuff on that website because i was the one doing a lot of 3ds stuff i got a wii u on launch day um when nobody else on the site had it so i was covering a lot of wii u games i was like well you know covering nintendo stuff is fun why don't i try to find a nintendo site to work for um and I ended up working for Nintendo enthusiasts. I just sent out a couple samples of my writing and they were like, okay, we'll, we'll start you out, but we're starting out on the, you know, the ground floor here. You know, you're just going to do news. You're not going to do reviews or anything like that until we say so. I was like, all right, that's cool. You know, it won't last because I'll, I'll end up, you know, taking over the site. And essentially I did, I ended up, I ended up becoming editor in chief of that. And then um, they had a YouTube channel and it had like a thousand subscribers on it. And I was like, holy shit, they got a thousand subscribers. I want to do videos for this. And so I talked to the site owner. I was like, hey, I want to make videos. And he was like, you ever made a video before? No. Do you know how to edit videos? No. <laughs> what do you have? I was like, I got like a $50 webcam. I've got a, a little like house lamp and Windows Movie Maker. And he was like, <laughs> you know, was I was like, like yeah, I'm serious. <laughs> like, like that's, that's what I got. And so he was like, all right, you know, we'll give it a try. And so at that same time, my editor for the book, Jason, he was hired by Nintendo enthusiast. He lives in Canada and he had like a $3,000 camera and editing team. He was filming all of his videos at ANC games in Canada. So he had a great backdrop and I'm literally in my bedroom filming with my little <laughs> shitty webcam. So like, it was just him and I doing videos. And I hated him. I hated him so much because his, <laughs> his quality was good. And mine was shit, but you know, eventually it ended up, um, you know, for the longest time, like that's, that's one thing, uh, complete side note, but that's one thing I see so many people that do YouTube do it wrong is that they invest all this money right at the start. And like, yeah, you can do that. And there is a somewhat of a chance that it's going to pay off for you, but most of the time it won't. And like, I didn't start upgrading my stuff until my channel started growing. I actually did not quit using windows movie maker until 2017 
So some of the videos made on RGT85 were actually edited in Windows Movie Maker for, for you know, the first two years of the channel. So, you know, you just got to eat. You got to move as you grow, then you start to expand. I used a Sony Handycam until 2018, until I got a, a DSLR. Like, I just, I never wanted to, you know, I didn't want to, you know, overstep my bounds on with it. You know, as the channel grew, I was like, okay, well, I can continue to grow with the channel. So that's just one little but, side. But I think you also, because I say that a lot to people too, you don't need to go out and buy the biggest and baddest when you're starting out, once you get going and you feel comfortable. But after, you learn how to do stuff. You said something in the beginning there. You said, the guy asked you, do you know how to edit videos? You're like, no. Do you know how to do this? No. You had to learn. You had to learn how to do that stuff before you knew that you needed some other stuff. Right, exactly. And I mean, you, you know, you just gotta, you gotta figure, and you gotta figure out what works for you. Like even today in 2020, I'm not a great editor. I am a pretty piss poor compared to some of my, you know, um, acquaintances and friends and stuff like that so i know when i'm making a video people aren't probably watching my video because of my great editing and there are channels that i'll watch because i like their editing i like their style and stuff like that i know that i have to get by on personality and yep. that's fine with me because that's how i've always been so it, it just works for me i know that you know if people are, are feeling what i'm feeling and you know uh you know like my personality or whatever then it'll work and if it if they don't like it then it's not going to be something for them so i've always, that's kind of what i've always realized um as far as my channel is concerned is just i have to get by on personality so hopefully i come across as personable well that's why we watch doug's channel because doug's the king of editing yeah. just just being real i mean oh. <laughs> i oh, don't he's got great editing i don't do uh, yeah, he does i'm not one for editing i hate editing that i'll do the live stuff i can edit on the fly but not like doug doug is like the master when it comes to editing I don't. I don't know about that. My my college video production professor would probably tell you otherwise. <laughs> Mainly because in college they taught us and they trained us on Avid, which was the oh. editing tool of the the media pros at the time, and I absolutely hated it. Oh, yes. So what I would do is just lie and take my project home and edit it in either Premiere or Final Cut Pro at home, and I would just bring it back and tell my producer or my, you know, my professor. I'm like, hey, here it is. Here's my project. Turn it in. You know. He's like, did you edit this on Avid? Because I didn't see you in the lab today. I'm like, oh, yeah, I, I just popped in, popped out or whatever. <laughs> and he's like, I know you didn't do it because that transition you used isn't in Avid. Oh. Like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Thinking outside the box, though. That's what you got to do. Now, Absolutely. I also, to me and Doug, believe it or not, now, go get a shot of me and Doug. Get us together. Put us both side by side here. Okay. So Doug works in the medical industry, and, and I work in the metal industry, right? Doug went for a broadcasting communications in school, and so did I. Now look at us. Yeah. What's wrong with this picture? You got you got you got a chiseled stud muffin on one side, and you have me on the other side with a Doug. Pack. This is your future. <laughs> yeah, I was getting ready to say he's, he's the ghost of Christmas future over here. <laughs> editing. I was editing with just videotape machines. Oh, time. See, time-based correcting time, uh, videotapes, that, oh my God. And I'm the only it's guy the, that works the pain in, and the horror. I'm the only guy that works in video and live production and, and software <laughs> for a living. Go figure. And I didn't go to school yep. for it. Yep. That's the way the cookie crumbles sometimes. There it is. Yeah. And I was actually, yep. I was actually in the medical field before doing ah. YouTube full time. Were you really done, what, done, sales done. salesman yeah. or what? What did you do? No, I was a, I was a, I was a certified pharmacy technician for like wow. ten years. Most oh, underappreciated money, goal man. in the pharmacy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. By far. <laughs> yeah. Now uh, the money, uh, the money wasn't great. The money got. I, I would say, because I worked for a corporate. You know, I worked for like uh, Rite Aid. You know, companies like that, and I also worked for independent ones independent pharmacies were just way better i felt they were it was it was a lot better than the, the corporate ones because i don't know I, I don't really fit in in the corporate world all that great but it's funny because i went to college for a, a business degree and then i dropped out and i never i never got it because i started working and i was like hey i'm making money here what am i gonna go to college for but see that you're, you're telling everybody that's in the chat room right now so if you want to be a popular youtuber you you have to go into the medical field like these three. That's that's what you have <laughs> right. to do because you're going right. to end up not doing yeah, you're it. You got to start with 
and you got to start with Windows Movie Maker. You got Windows Movie bottom. Maker. Boom. And a 480p webcam. <laughs> no, Glenn already did I that. Three, I had a 320. Yeah. Glenn was yeah, already at that. That was the first thing Stephen did, man. Steve was like, "What are you using? Get that thing out of here! I can't even see you." We're doing what? a high definition Dude, broadcast, you... and he's sitting there with a 320, like the size of your Nokia screen, <laughs> 120 by three. I'm like Glenn. I'm like nobody's gonna see what you're showing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If they're looking at this, and I'm like Glenn, it looks like a giant pixel. Yeah. Pixel. I'm like nobody can <laughs> see that. It, it, it was a 12 pixel camera. I mean, you know. I well, we saw there. every pixel too. We saw the every all pixel. 12. All 12. <laughs> <laughs> but no, that's I you know, it's it's pretty cool for people to see, you know, backgrounds. I would have never guessed that with you guys. Um now, Sean, are you doing YouTube full time? I know probably people have asked that or do you kind of do something else to kind of supplement income on the side besides writing books and no, I do it. I do it full time. I went full time um, actually two years ago next month. Wow. Congratulations. 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 Thank you. Thank you. What Happy was, anniversary. What was the deciding factor where you said, man, I got to do this full time? Because then there's a lot of guys out there, I think, that think they should go full time into YouTube and in reality they shouldn't. I, I'm not a YouTuber, so yeah. I don't know. I'm asking this question just. I What I did was, is I realized. I was living in North Carolina at the time and I wasn't happy in North Carolina and I'd been there forever. And I was like, I need to get, I need to get out of here. I need, I need, I need to change what I'm doing. Cause I just, as the years were going by, it was just like, you know, just pharmacy technician and yay, go home, live in North Carolina. <laughs> I like, I don't like this. So I started, you know, YouTube started making a little bit of scratch for me. And I was like, okay, I'm not going to spend any of this money. And I would just, I just sat on all that money and I saved it up. And then I started making, you know, close to what I was making at the day job. And I was like, you know, I'm only really giving this, you know, 50% of my effort, if that, because I would basically wake up at, you know, eight shower, be at work at eight 30, work till six on the drive home. I would figure out what sort of video I wanted to do. And then I would go home, throw some dinner in the microwave, film the video, eat the food while I was editing the video, upload the video, and then go to sleep. And like that was just my life forever. And like I just got used to it or whatever. But I was like, you know, I want, I want to try, I want to try this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna bust my ass for a couple months and see how it goes on YouTube. So that's what I started doing. And like it started working out really good. And I, you know, started, you know, making a little bit of money on it. And I was like, well you know what, I'm going to try it full time, you know? So what I did was I, I set a dollar amount that, cause I also moved when I went full time. That was one of the stipulations I set for myself. It's like, when I move, I want to move and I want to go full time on YouTube. I just want to start fresh and try this. And so the stipulation was, I basically figured out how much it was going to cost me for my rent at my new place, um, all my utility bills and, you know, just how much I needed per month. And I wanted to save enough to have six to eight months just in case it didn't work out. And then, you know, I would at least have something to fall back on and then I could figure out my next move. So once I got that dollar amount is when, and thankfully it just, it all lined up in a perfect timeline for me personally. So I had that dollar amount and I was like, all right, let's give it a shot. And so that's, that's pretty much what I did. I just, I just jumped in and thankfully it's, it's worked out. Very, very cool. That's, I mean, that's something I think everybody aspires to on YouTube. I know Glenn's been doing it. Glenn's yeah. still aspiring to do it, right? Yeah, I'm still aspiring. Four year, four year plus years later, I'm still aspiring, but I'm, I'm creeping up by tomorrow. I think I'll have uh, 15 subscribers. So I'm, I'm <laughs> making my mark. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it, and the thing about YouTube is, you know, people, are, people take it. I think a lot of, of people take it for granted because to me, it's like, I know, it, it was, you know, a lot of luck went into it. And, you know, you could, you could bust your ass to make YouTube work and there's still a chance that it wouldn't work out for you. And I guess that's right. any sort of aspect right. of life. But like, I, uh, my philosophy is like every day I'm thankful that, that this is what I could do because I enjoy doing it. But I also know at the same time that like it could all end tomorrow. Mm. And that's why when I see people, you know, spending a whole bunch of money, like, I don't spend shit. Like I save 
all my mo my money's saved and you know save it for a rainy day and if the day comes when youtube goes belly up because you know there's no job security with this uh, you know right. Right. you don't know what's going to happen right. so you know i just take it day by day and but yeah like i said thankfully everything is has definitely worked out so far uh for the past two years that, that, right and it's, it's a lot of work people i mean it's fun and i'm, I'm glad rtt says he enjoys it I mean, i enjoy it i'm sure cool to anyone else enjoys it but it's also a lot of work it's not all fun and games there's a lot of time a lot of time involved in doing the whole process and if you don't push content up you know you're not making anything and, I'm, and since rtt that's his thing he's constantly has to be pushing up new content and that's a lot of work yeah, yeah and then you're also you're also at the uh, mercy <laughs> of YouTube itself, as far as ad revenue is concerned, like my December and my January views um, for December, 2019, January, 2020, were pretty comparable. I might've actually had a little bit more views in the month of January than I did in December, but my revenue is like half for the month of January than it was right. in December because there's more advertisers. That's why you see a lot of people take January off or upload a hell of a lot less. and because the money just, you know, nobody's putting money into advertisements. There's no holidays going on. There's no summer stuff going on. January is statistically always the worst month for YouTube. Now, I don't care. Like I still put out a bunch of videos um, just because I, I wanted to, I wanted to put out videos because I find it entertaining. But even, even, you know, for, you know, gaming news and games to review and stuff like that, I don't, I didn't do a single game, new game review this entire month of January. The only review I actually did or the Evercade because nothing comes out in January. Like right. I didn't, I, there was nothing that came out that I was like, wow, I need to really review this game. And now with February coming up, like I've already got like six or seven games that I plan on reviewing. And then the rest of the year will just be crazy. But yeah. Yeah, that's, that's kind of how we were right before like the CES, everything was speculation, speculation, speculation. And then the CES announcements came out and then everybody's like, okay, now what, you know? For, for, <laughs> yeah. fortunately like yeah, I at, mean, it, at games is putting out like firmware every week for you know so we can right. at least talk about that but i mean like arcade one up we're waiting for them to launch you know the machines so we could get our hands on them and talk about it but we're really glenn we're dead in the water well we got your tron controller we could talk about no yeah, there's yeah there's, there's still plenty of stuff to talk about i mean we have people still doing lots of mods we have a lot of uh smaller companies coming out with things i mean the bigger companies it's, it's going to be a little bit more of a wait, but there's always stuff uh, happening. And we have a lot of, a lot of people still lined up, you know, uh, for guest hosts. There's a lot of things still happening out there. So, but like I said, January is just going to be a month anyway, because you're getting over the, the big holiday. So January is usually the recoup month, even, even for us, but we're still, we're still yeah. pushing, we're still pushing out content. We're still doing it. Yeah. Yeah. And John, John says, John says in the chat room, he says, uh, Capcom loves February and March. And oh, yeah. Cat. Yep, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say they, they do. That's when they always put out, start putting out their games for the year. It's very early in the year. I do want to tell everybody, though, yep. after, you know, at the at top of the hour, we are going to end the, the recording part of the show, but we're going to open up a post show that you guys can call in. So for those that are watching us live, you have the, the, the ability to call us in. We'll put that link in the chat room here in a little bit, and you can call in and ask uh, um, Sean questions that you may have or maybe you got one for doug or or, or glenn um that's the time that we're, yeah, we'll we'll open it up and we'll get as many people in as we can like we like last week we had a full panel so i couldn't really do anything with it but we are going to do that this week to give you guys the opportunity to to tell glenn uh you know we like his his joystick oh oh <laughs> hope it's something good <laughs> don't tell me something else <laughs> I mean, that's about as complimentary as it gets there, Glenn. People commenting uh, on your joystick. See that? Uh, hey, no, I'm no be it whatsoever. I'm <laughs> I wouldn't do such a thing to Glenn. <laughs> I, I, I don't get in trouble. I'm just going to go you know, right, right across there. All right. So let's kind of let's 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 talk about this for a second. So before the show started, I said to you guys about this i saw it on pc world and i know sean you you you're holding one that you can kind of compare it to this i i personally i took my psp and i and i modded it and put all kinds of retro games on it because uh, my my and my vita because it's like well vita is being a well 
upgraded version. <laughs> well, the Vita, the Vita essentially is being a paperweight right now, so I figured, well, I might as well do something with it. Um, but this uh, they showed on on uh, PC World, and they said it was actually pretty good for sixty seven ninety nine. You can get this, um, you know, with a thirty two gig uh, SD card in it, and it comes with rainbow colored buttons. Like if you want to do the whole um, Super Nintendo, well, when the Super Nintendo was in, I guess, Japanese when they had it, and it was a different color. But if you want to put those buttons in uh, for PlayStation, or I guess if you want to mod it. Good price, bad price. Is this something that people should be taking a look at? Maybe picking up? Looks like it's got a 3.5 inch dis uh, display. Glenn, it would work with your webcam. It's a 320 by 240. <laughs> it's, it's perfect. Yeah. What do you guys think? I mean, think? I, can talk, I can talk to it a little bit because I literally have it right in my hands. Oh, look at this guy. Oh, I got it right <laughs> here in my hands. Oh, I got it in my hands. I didn't say nothing. I'm sorry, I, I can't. I couldn't resist. I was gonna let you keep, you know, talking about it. But no, uh, this is, you know, their second attempt uh, at a Pocket Go portable. Um, previously, they had an earlier rendition that came out earlier in the year. Um, very good little device, but it suffered one major flaw, and then it had screen tearing issues because of the, the megahertz they used on the screen. So when you play something like Sonic or Mario, you get these awful screen tears, and it would really just take you out of the game. It was super well priced and very, you know, ergonomically good in the hands and it just felt better than a lot of the chinese consoles that were out there so this is a nice little upgrade i enjoy it 60 dollars is a good price it doesn't have that screen terry um one thing i don't like about it is this little nubby joystick that it's got like it it's just too small and like my thumb slides off and the company actually has like a, a little makeshift uh fix in play where they're putting little rubber silicone type overlays over it to where they'll send it to you for free if you bought one of these from them where that's supposed to help with traction um mine is on the slow boat from china so i haven't got my little silicone um overlays yet so i haven't got to test that out but as far as how good it is it plays all your retro consoles all the way you know nintendo sega atari plays arcade games via mame um, and final burn alpha plays playstation one games although you'll notice it obviously only has one joystick on it so some of those dual joystick games are not going to be ideal if you do want dual joysticks you want to go with this the rg350 basically these are almost identical they have the same processing power and board inside of them um, screen size is about the same on both of them it just really comes down to um, the little functionalities that you want do you want dual joysticks or do you want single joysticks do you care uh, if playstation one emulation is something you're after you know you're going to probably going to go towards this but either way if you're just looking to play a lot of retro games in a very cheap affordable method and have something that it's in your pocket that you don't really have to worry about like destroying so like if 60 dollars goes out the window versus you know 300 dollars for you know those official fancy upgraded handhelds that are on the market <laughs> You, you're you're not gonna cry as much if that gets smashed or left in your coat pocket and goes in the dry cleaner or something like that. So I recommend it. So we didn't talk about this earlier, but this was something that I was gonna have us start doing on a weekly basis: is do our pick of the week of what we thought would be a cool item that we could kind of round table. And Doug didn't even know I was gonna bring this up. Uh, it was in pre-show. I was talking to, to these guys, and Mister, I have it right there. Uh, you know, <laughs> listen. I'm not going to the four box right now because and you guys will see why in a minute, but I, I'm going to go to the four box here in a second. But uh, I think next week we'll see. So he, he definitely recommends it. 67 bucks. You get the SD card with it, 32 K 32 gig. Um, now you guys know why I wasn't going to go to the four box right away. <clears throat> Cause I wanted to get that out without laughing um, because of you. There's a shortage in the world for those masks. You do know that, right? Hey, man, I got to be protected, man. Well, that coronavirus I, is everywhere. Listen, I get it. People are going to be calling in. I get it. But really, that's not necessary. <laughs> I, I, I really don't think that's necessary. But we're going to wrap up this recording portion of it. We've got, uh, we want to thank Mr. Uh, Sean Long, RGT85. Check him out, youtube.com slash RGT85. And check out his book over on Amazon. And if you want an autographed one that hopefully will say the right name on it, you can guys can go no check it out. No problem. <laughs> you can hopefully get it. Uh, check it out. And uh, we also want to thank uh, Mr. Cool Toy himself, Douglas Smith, for joining us. Check him out. Yep. YouTube. Yeah, check out Sean's book. It's great. 
YouTube.com slash cool toy. And uh, you will definitely hopefully get a pick from him next week. Maybe something that he doesn't have. Uh, <laughs> and of course we've got the swan virus. I mean, the coronavirus guy, uh, Mr. Planamento. He's what are you doing? That? What are you doing? Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Whoa. <laughs> it's a great book. Great book. <laughs> Read it later, not during the show. Ladies and gentlemen, Glenn Planamento, youtube.com slash Glenn's Retro Show. Make sure you head over to Kickstarter and uh, get behind his Kickstarter because um, you want to get that uh, Atari Yokes for the uh, for the Star Wars machines. Uh, Glenn, that'll be that'll also work. Correct me if I'm wrong. That'll also work for the Legends. Or is this yeah, just the, the plan is no the, the the plan is to have it working with arcade one up uh the legends ultimate and also pc pi mac or any device that'll accept a usb analog joystick or a usb mouse that should work for pretty much anything perfect that's the goal wow so there you guys have it go check it out and guys make sure you subscribe to the channels we'll be posting all this up on youtube as we do every week we appreciate everybody coming in, in here. And those of you that are still sticking around, stay on. We're going to get you guys to call in and ask your questions. And hopefully he won't be wearing that stupid mask when we go into post-show. Uh, <laughs> but I can't promise anything. That's just the nature of this show. And things get out of control when we end this. So we'll see you guys next week for more here <laughs> of the Retro Buzz. And wait, Glenn, who do we have next week? Uh, next week will be a surprise guest. I don't want to give it away just yet. I know we're booked so through the end of sure February. I know we're booked through the yes, end of we February. Are. Yes. Next week is a surprise guest. Okay. Surprise it's a guest. Surprise you, have guest. Of, you have to tune in to see. All right. To tune in to see. All right. We'll see you guys next week here on the Retro Buzz. <laughs> <laughs>